in a <laughs> few seconds. Looks like you're live broadcast. On yeah, click broadcast. And Minnie, you're gonna let everybody in, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And my screen share is up. So you, I yeah, I, you're up. Everybody's pouring in. It looks oh, great. Okay. We've got folks coming on in. Oh, I'm so excited. Look at our early birds. I love the early birds. These these yeah. folks are just like, we're ready to go. Hey, you guys, make sure you hit the chat. Tell us where you are. Tell us what you're doing. Tell us where you're from. Say hi if we know you. We're that excited was... to be here. We'll get started in just a minute or two. Let's just get a chance to let everybody come pouring on in, Dr. Liz. So great. How are you doing this morning? I am loaded for, uh, my dad would say loaded for beer. I got to come up with a cat pun for that. But I'm super excited. I'm heavily caffeinated. I'm finishing up my caffeine. Um, got my LaCroix. I'm going to stay hydrated and yes. happy. I'm so excited to be talking about cats. How cool is it that we have a whole weekend of cat behavior from, you know, what's so cool, Becky, is almost all of these lectures really usually only speak to veterinarians. Yeah, I know. Well, so I was like, you guys, we have a hot lineup. So I hope you guys are super excited. We have got an amazing lineup of people. Honestly, I'm excited to say I'm hanging out with my friends this weekend. Yeah, right? It's the best. It, it's, this is some of the most brilliant minds in veterinary medicine, behavioral medicine, behavioral um, techniques, behavioral communication, knowledge. And what I'm seeing, you guys, is like, we've got everybody, Dr. Liz, I see Australia, I see Dallas, uh -huh. I see Angie in Chicago, um, I see um, where I just saw Puerto Rico, um, Delmar, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, we've got Georgia, we've got veterinarians, we've got cat moms, dads, parents, guardians, we got a little everybody with us today, are you ready for this? changed in the past five years, our no. knowledge and... Um, and the depth of, of understanding and research has really changed in the past five years. So yeah. uh, you guys are coming at a really great time when we're sort of cresting the wave of, of knowledge and information and enthusiasm, really with the support of companies like Facebook. Yeah. yeah, and that's exactly right. Base Paws is about science, but they're also just all things, med all things cats, all things behavior, all things veterinary, healthy, happy cats, right? Best. The best. Okay, well, we've got a bunch of people in here already to go, so I don't want to hold you up because you have so much great content. That's what they really want to hear. You guys, I just want to introduce, first of all, if you don't know me, I'm your cat coach, Becky. I'm a registered veterinary technician, and I am your MC for the weekend. So you will with be with me as we move through these amazing speakers and this amazing weekend. Um, you guys, keep that content up in the chat. I will be here fielding your questions. You can put them in the Q&A. You can put them in the chat. I will um, get to them as quick as I can. Um, Dr. Liz is going to do her presentation, and then we're going to leave lots and lots of time for um, Q&A from you guys. I see North Carolina in the house. That's my, this is where I'm from. Dr. Liz, where are you at today? Philly. Philly in the house. Are you getting gold up there yet? You know what? Th this is bliss in Philadelphia right now. It is like crisp and leaves changing and we've had like the bluest skies all week. So um, remind me of that in February and March, please. I'm here for you, girl. Come visit me in North Carolina <laughs> while we still have blue skies in February. <laughs> all right, guys. So Dr. Liz, I, I can't imagine anybody on here does not already know Dr. Liz, but just in case, I want to um, make sure that you guys know uh, that <laughs> make sure we're recording on here. I want to introduce to you guys, Dr. Liz Bales live from Philly. She is a writer, a speaker. She is an expert. She is an inventor. She is an entrepreneur. She is Doc and Phoebe's in the house. Dr. Liz Bales to talk to you about how your cat really feels. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Bales. Thank you. And I'm so excited to be here kicking this weekend off. So thank you for getting up early on the West Coast, maybe 10 o'clock is a little before, you know, we want to be waking up and out of bed and rolling. I really appreciate you joining me. And I am so happy to have all this great information to share with you. When I was a vet student and I've been around cats all my life, I thought I understood them. 
And then through the course of my veterinary career, I learned so many things that it's not exactly what you thought. So I'm here to tell you how your cat really feels. Uh, and so through my career, I found that I was treating cats all the time for the same things. They would gobble up their food and throw it up. They would pee outside the litter box. They'd be aggressive, destructive. Uh, and you know, these are not things that I could fix with a, a shot or a pill. And it really made me start to go learn about behavior. And uh, that is what really started everything for me. And when I learned all about it, which I'm gonna share with you today, I found that the information without a solution was getting us nowhere. So there were not products in the market to be able to solve the biggest problems for cats uh, in 2014. And so I started digging in and doing it myself. So I'm gonna end that poll and Oh, well, Becky, Bob, I, I, I wasn't aware of what's happening with the polls. So I'm gonna just share my screen there. So the US loves our cats. Uh, we have more cats than dogs living in homes in America, but um, they're not getting the same care and we don't understand them as well as the dogs. You know, only, for every five dogs that go to the vet, only one cat goes. Uh, and they, there's a lot of problems and we wanna know why, if we love them so much, what's the problem? And again, they're trouble, cats are trouble. So we, they've all the good stuff, right? You guys know all that, but they also have a lot of stuff that is a big problem. Uh, and so, you know, we have this cat shaming, but what I've learned over the course of my career is that we actually maybe should be looking at ourselves for the shame not the cats. So we don't understand them. We don't give them what they need innately because it's very different than what we are. And that causes them enormous amounts of stress. When they're under that stress from not being able to perform their natural behaviors, they express that anxiety and stress in ways we don't like. So they gobble up their food, they get food obsessed, and then they throw it up. They pee outside the litter box. They do all that stuff, really, that you, like I saw in my veterinary hospitals, I would do full exams, and that's always the first step. We want to make sure there's not a physical problem, but many, many times there wasn't, and the problem is anxiety and stress. So that is also true for you guys. Look at this, anxiety and stress, aggression, nighttime hyperactivity. We're gonna talk about all these things. So uh, what does that mean for the cat, right? It's no fun for you, but what does that mean for the cat? Oh, it doesn't wanna let me share, Becky. There we go. Do you guys know the number one cause of death for cats? I didn't. I had been a veterinarian for 14 years and I was among the, you know, really enthusiastic elite studying cats and veterinary medicine. And I did not know the number one cause of death for cats. The number one cause of death for cats is simply being unwanted because of a behavior problem that breaks the human animal bond and gets you sent back to the shelter. And the shelters are doing everything that they can with very little resources and time. And ultimately there's no room for cats, something like 70% of cats that go into the shelter never come out. So these numbers are improving, that is the good news. But you can see 1.4 million cats were put to sleep in shelters in 2015. So here I was at the veterinary hospital doing all of these really important things to make cats well, but not treating the number one cause of death for cats. And uh, when I learned that, my life changed forever. How, how is this possible? This has to change. And so I started on this journey. Here's the problem. We wanna spoil our cats. We wanna give them the best of everything, but we don't understand what their needs are. Cats and people are really different. And if we spoil them like a human, we're actually depriving them of their ability to be a cat. 
And it's not just euthanasia. This stress is responsible for most of the common diseases that we see in cats. You can see this big list here. The research directly links the stress of the inability to perform your natural behaviors with this big list of problems. And I bet you guys have, if you've been cat owners, you've seen one, two, three, or all of these things. So here's where it gets a little crazy because sometimes we have a hard time wrapping our brain around this. Like, why is it so hard for the cat? My house is great. Everything's wonderful. I do everything for my cat. Yeah, but you're doing your thing, maybe not the cat thing. And it's not innate for people to understand what cats need. So walk with me on this crazy journey and let's see if I can help you get to this place. So imagine the pandemic's over. And while we were all locked inside, giant robin redbreasts took over the world. They turned it back into a forest. And really they got rid of most of the people because as strays, we were really a lot of problem. We kept trying to wanna to put concrete in houses. But a few of us got chosen to be the cherished pet. And the ones that get picked, these robins love us more than anything in the entire world. And they treat us like they're, we are their babies. And I'm so lucky. I didn't get euthanized. I got chosen. But um, up here in this nest, like 50 feet off the ground, it's prickly. I don't have anyone to talk to. I know this bird is trying to be nice to me, but she's actually kind of scary. And uh, I don't have any of my normal stress relief. There's no sofa. I can't exercise up here. I don't have chocolate or Facebook, which is what normally I would do to get through a rough day. And day after day, it's starting to really be a problem. So to deal with my stress, I'm starting to play with my hair. And now, you know, after a few weeks, maybe pull some out and pick at my skin. And my guts are really bothering me because uh, mealtime is a particular stressor. Because even though robins eat healthier food than anything I've eaten all week, uh, so I'm gonna get worms, which is great protein, and I'm gonna get seeds and berries and lots of great nutritious organic food, it's gonna be delivered in a way that doesn't meet my needs. Do you guys know how many times a day a robin redbreast feeds her baby? And I bet you know how. So up to a hundred times a day, I am going to have this regurgitated food delivered into my mouth because she loves me so much. She wants to treat me like I'm her baby. Do you see what I mean? It's not really working. So if she loved me to spoil me and give me what I need, she would make this beautiful picnic on the forest floor. And even if she needed me up in the nest most of the time, she would let me go down and eat at a table with a knife and a fork. Really, I, a glass of wine would be lovely if that's available, but I need to behave like a human, not a bird. So just like there are innate differences between me and that bird living in her home, there are really important innate differences between people and cats. And when we keep cats indoors, if you think about it for a second, it's really just like that bird. We are controlling everything. So we decide who they live with, if they have roommates, we decide their bathroom, we decide how they eat, we decide what they eat, we decide the furniture, on and on and on. So really our homes are just giant cages. They're lovely, beautiful, wonderful giant cages and they're safe, but they're, they're not made for a cat. And a cat needs to be a cat in some really critical ways. So when I first started veterinary medicine, I thought that this in 2000, by the way, it's been, it's been a minute. I thought that this was cat care. So we've got a litter box, We've got food and water, the food and water are right next to each other. And human beings don't really like litter boxes. So if we could, if we could get a cat that doesn't have to go to the bathroom, that would be great. But if they do have to go to the bathroom, we wanna give them the smallest possible litter box in the furthest nether regions of our home so that we do not have to deal with the reality of cat bathrooms. Uh, and it turns out 
this is not enough. And not meeting our cat's needs is actually causing the bad behavior and causing the health problems that give us such a hard time, break the human animal bond, make our cat sick and even send them back to the shelter. So what are really minimum cat needs? Cats have to have places to climb, places to hide, a way to hunt. We need to understand their need for appropriate smells, what smells are too much for them. We need to understand that they communicate through smell. We need to understand that territory and access to resources is everything to a cat. We need to understand that they actually need to scratch and how to give them that in a way that we can live with. And the postage stamp bathroom that we never clean in the middle of the boiler room is not cutting it. We need to give them a bathroom that they want. And when we do this and we meet their needs, those sicknesses get better and the bad behaviors go away. So from, I'm a kid of the 70s and the 80s. So this uh, uh, cat food commercial, I'm sure anybody my age remembers that we wanna spoil our cats, which means treating them like a person. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really like eating this way either. <laughs> I like that uh, in front of my Netflix um, on my lap, but uh, this is definitely not the way a cat wants to eat. But by feeding a cat, and trying to spoil them like a human, we are causing our own problems. And now I'm sure Dr. Ward is gonna talk about this and you might hear it multiple times uh, throughout the weekend. 60% of cats in America are overweight or obese. That causes diabetes, it worsens osteoarthritis, it stresses the organs. And uh, Dr. Ward is gonna cover that you know, at length. So I urge you to tune into his lecture but it's not just what we feed that is causing this problem. It is also how we feed because a cat is not meant to eat one or two giant meals a day from a bowl. So let's talk about the difference between people and cats. Human beings are communal survivors. We're cooperative. We need each other to survive. So we will, plant together, we you know, hunt together, unless you're a mom and have to go to the grocery store by yourself. But uh, our nature is to really use food as a social experience. It's almost impossible for us to understand not using food as a social experience, so much so that it's a punishment. If you're the kid who no one will eat with at lunch in the cafeteria, that solitary eating is a punishment. So no one would wanna do that to their cat. Only nature made cats to be solitary survivors. So cats hunt alone, they eat alone. They do not expect anyone to ever come and rescue them or take care of them. You don't see cats fighting for each other. They will fight for themselves. But no one is coming to save a cat's life. And once you're done being a kitten, no one is delivering you food and this is not a social experience. And a mouse or a bird or a frog or a lizard, the edible contents of most of a cat's prey is about a tablespoon and a half and it's about 30 to 35 calories. That is not enough to share. So if cats were cooperative and having to share these tiny prey, they would starve to death. Nature gives them this very strong instinct to hunt, catch, play, and eat prey multiple times a day alone. So this fact is mind blowing, but on average for a cat to survive, they need to hunt, catch, play, kill, and eat between eight and 12 mice every single day. That number blows my mind. So mother nature to, to get them to do that had to put inside this tremendous urge to hunt and, and catch food. So for your cat who's eating from a bowl is the happiest day of their year when a spider or a cricket or a fly gets in the house. 
your cat actually needs to hunt, catch, play, and eat multiple small meals a day. The more small meals spread out throughout the day, the better. And in fact, cats are opportunistic. And here's our, here's our million dollar word for the day, crepuscular. Cats are not uh, nocturnal and they're not diurnal during the day like us, they're crepuscular. So they're opportunists. They'll eat when their prey is out, but that's mostly dawn and dusk. So what we see is cats want to play with their food. In nature, they'll spend 80% of their waking hours playing with their food, hunting, seeking, finding. The actual catch and kill is relatively short and the eating is relatively short. And their stomach is only the size of a ping pong ball. This is their reason for waking up in the morning. This is their physical exercise and their mental exercise. So when we bring them inside and feed them from a bowl, they have nothing to do all day. They have nowhere to put that instinct that they would have been using 80% of their waking hours. And it gets redirected into either sleeping 23 hours a day, food obsession, or getting up to stuff we don't like. And in fact, it can be responsible for causing the stress that makes cats pee outside the litter box. So, Part of minimum cat care is providing a way for your cat to meet that cycle of behaviors of seek out, hunt, catch, play, and eat that tiny meal many times a day, mostly at dawn and dusk. And when I learned this, and I was talking to my veterinary friends and saying like, well, what are you guys gonna do when you get back to your hospital? There's no way for anybody to do this. And you know, there were some arts and crafts projects available, but to make six, eight, 10 of these for, for each cat and do it every single day, what are we gonna do? And this is one of the factors that is causing our cats to be sick and even for us to put them to sleep. And they said nothing, what are we supposed to do? There is nothing to use. What? Well, I'm just not gonna talk about it. And I found that entirely unacceptable. And that's when I invented the hunting feeder, which has now been around for about five or six years, where you put your food inside that mouse and hide it around the house. So your cat actually gets to go through the hunt, catch, play, and eat cycle of that ping pong ball size portion at least six times a day. And what I recommend is that you do it morning and before you go to work, because cats are solitary hunters, they, they may have adjusted to eating with us, but they are designed to hunt and eat alone. So there gives them something to do while you're gone and something to do overnight. Because I noticed on that list, that nighttime behavior, remember how I said that it, it cats wanna hunt mostly at dawn and dusk. So mother nature put that urge into your cat, even if your cat has never spent time outside. So at four or five or six in the morning, mother nature is telling your cat, I want to interact. I wanna have that predatory behavior and then a small meal because I would be very interested, Becky, I don't know if we have the, the ability to go back and ask the people who said that their cats have that nighttime activity and they get up and feed them, how often there's actually food in the bowl. Because almost everybody I ask says, yes, there is food in the bowl. And that is because cats don't just want to eat. Cats want to hunt, catch, play, which they just achieved by waking you up and making you go to the bowl. They got their predatory interaction, hopefully minus the blood, uh, and then they got their food. So they were very, very clever and found a way to meet their needs. But if you hide the hunting feeders overnight, the cat gets to perform their natural behavior and you get to sleep. So I mentioned before the cats are solitary survivors. This difference is really hard for us to understand. We need other people. I've asked Becky for help a couple of times during this talk already. We need each other to survive and we're programmed to really have all of our behaviors through helping each other uh, and, and sustaining each other. Cats are totally different. They are solitary survivors who find their comfort in safe places that smell like them. 
So for instance, for a human being, if I had to go do something scary, let's say I had to go to the doctor and I was worried I was sick, I would take my husband or I would take my best friend and them being with me would make me as comfortable as I'm gonna be because I, human beings are a cooperative species. That is not the same for cats. And that makes things really, really tricky for cats because cats do not find comfort in other people. So if your cat has to go do something that makes them afraid, your companionship is not going to really be what is gonna make them feel calm and relaxed. And I think we've all had that experience. Cats want a familiar place that's small, that smells like them. I know that um, uh, you're gonna get a lecture, I think next about uh, cats and friends, but I, I think you're gonna hear a lot about how important pheromones are and sense of smell. So a cat feels comfortable if their space smells like them. So we find ourselves in this situation all the time. So people who, particularly people who love cats, want to be with them and cuddle them and have these experiences. Can you imagine what that looks like to a cat with someone coming at them all the time? And then we say, no, cats are so aloof. They're so independent. They don't need anyone. It really is because they see the world entirely differently. And someone coming at them makes them feel scared, makes them feel overwhelmed. And they want to get their safety from a small place where they're in control of the interaction and to come out or not. So human beings also, if you think about it, if uh, so Becky and I are friends and if she walked in the room, I would look up and say, oh, Becky, you're here. I'm so glad. Now I feel safe because you're with me. But that's not the way cats work. Cats really recognize each other by smell and by this comfort in a familiar space. So, have, have any of you guys ever had uh, more than one cat and you went to the vet and you came home and now the ones who didn't go to the vet won't have anything to do with or even beat up the cat that they've been living with for years? It's because they smell wrong. They smell like fear and cleaning products and the veterinarian and uh, you know alcohol. Not not wine, really, I mean rubbing alcohol. But so they, they, uh, they smell wrong. And for a cat, even though this is the same looking cat, it doesn't smell right. And until it smells like me, I'm not gonna feel safe. So we all know the dreaded cat carrier. This has become uh, what I call the cat carrier comma, there will be blood. Because what we've done is not understood what a cat needs to feel safe. And we've actually made the cat carrier the enemy. We drag it out only on the day when it's time to go to the vet. Uh, it smells like the garage or the attic or the back of the closet. And it smells like fear from the last time the cat was in it. And your cat is gonna take one look at that thing and they are out of here. And now the cat that you usually love and respect and care for, you are climbing under the bed or sofa and dragging them out by whatever body part you can grab because you don't want to miss your appointment. And then somehow, some way, you jam them in there uh, and hopefully get that door shut and get on the road. And uh, when you get to the cat, when you get to the vet, um, it's almost impossible to get them out. They're in the back of a carrier, scared to death. We shake them or pull them. And now we wonder why our veterinary appointments are starting off poorly. Imagine if that was you. You're terrified and you have no way of understanding what's going on. But we can actually use the way a cat sees the world to our benefit and make the carrier their best friend and not their worst enemy. Because these are the faces that we are used to seeing. Even our sweetest, kindest cats can turn into angry monsters when they see that plastic enemy. So we talked about this. 
There, it smells like fear. It only comes out when scary things are happening. You who normally treasure me, force me in. And then by the way, we use the strap or the handle and think it's our handbag because that's, that's our second nature or a suitcase and swing it around. And uh, then we, they get pulled or shaken out when they get to the bed. There's a better way. The cat carrier should be your cat's most favorite place to spend their time. It should be out in your environment every single day. And I don't mean at the back of the laundry room where nobody is. You should have a cat carrier that you love to look at that is gonna be in your main living space all the time, every single day, because that's gonna be your cat's treasured bed. You wanna put something cozy and lovely inside that is gonna smell like your cat. And you're gonna give them treats in there every single day. And I don't necessarily mean training treats. I mean that your cat is gonna smell something, eventually choose on their own to jump inside and find that this is like magic inside this bed, this cozy bed. I find my favorite food like at least once a day. So this place is amazing. And now I'm leaving my comfortable, happy pheromones all over this carrier. So it smells like and has the pheromones of happiness. You want every single piece of that carrier to be together all the time. Because as soon as you go to get a piece of it from your attic or your garage, you've ruined it. Now it's scary, it's wrong, and it smells wrong. So you want that entire carrier out in your environment all the time so that it smells right, it feels right. Now, this is my trusted place. So when it's time for me to travel, I feel the most comfortable I can possibly feel because I am in my comfortable, safe place. So I hope this video is gonna work. But do you see in how these straps are pulling pulled out? So normally they're snug, see if I can go back. They're snugged inside and underneath the bed. So every single part of this is in one place. And what looks like the hole of the cat cave there, when uh, it's used as a bed, that screen is rolled up and it is snapped inside. So every part of it, is gonna smell like your cat on their happiest day. So, let me try again here with my, there we go. So now a tree goes inside on vet day and your cat is actually gonna to want to jump in. I had to show all this preparing to jump of Phoebe here, which I think is hysterical. You've, you've taken a screen out. Now you're gonna close the screen and you can even practice this and walk around your house so that on vet day, uh, this isn't scary. There's nothing bad associated with this at all. And we're holding, even though it has those nice long straps, we're gonna hold it from the bottom. Because you see, imagine being inside that carrier versus this one. Your cat does not wanna go on a roller coaster ride. And then you're gonna put the carrier on the floor between the seats in the back seat to keep it as stable as possible. And, uh, I don't want that again. So now when you get to the vet, you've had, let's go to the bottom and not my big silly grin. But for number one, it's their happy place. Number two, we got them in the carrier with a treat and happiness. We, by the way, we did not wash the bed inside to impress the veterinarian. We left that bed full of cat hair and treat bits and everything else that makes our cat feel comfortable and safe. Don't try a new treat that day, nothing different. So we got to the vet with as little stress as possible in the carrier. Now, instead of grabbing them or pulling them or dumping them out, or trying to MacGyver apart all of those uh, nuts and bolts, you're just gonna unzip that clamshell and flip the lid back. And now your cat is actually gonna be examined inside the bottom of their carrier that looks and feels like them. They're not slipping around. It's not reflective on that stainless steel surface. And the I'm telling you, the entire vet visit is different. You can imagine 
if I just put you through all of what I talked about in human terms and then plopped you on the exam table of your doctor's office, are you ready for your exam or are you like your blood pressure is going to be through the roof and your heart rate is through the roof, which by the way, is exactly the same for cats. Their blood pressure, their uh, body temperature, their heart rate are all elevated because they're scared to death. And it doesn't have to be that way. We can use their natural instincts to make our problems go away and make them happier and healthier. So back at home, we have to understand that our cats need places to climb. They're solitary hunters. So when they get in trouble or just to relax, no one's ever protecting them. So they need to be able to survey their whole environment to feel safe all the time. So in all the rooms where your cat spends time, you're gonna to wanna to provide places to climb. Do you have two cats, three cats, nine cats? Then you need that many individual places for them to climb so they have their own resources their own territory, even if they shift around, they need that. Each cat needs their own and they need the places to hide. But you can use both of those things to your advantage. So is your cat getting up on your kitchen counter? Take a look around your kitchen. Is that the highest place in the room that your cat can jump to or climb to? You just made your situation. You did that. You want them not to climb on your kitchen counter anymore? Put a nice, tall climbing thing, a bookcase, a cat shelf, a cat tree. You can glue together Amazon boxes if your budget is tight. Doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but find some way to have your cat have a place to climb that's higher than your kitchen counter. Make it smell like them. You can do that by rubbing their bed or a towel on them while you're giving them treats and then rub it on your climbing thing and then feed them treats up there. And soon enough, your cat is gonna rather be on the higher place than your kitchen counter. So we can use these instincts to create the environment and the life that we want to be happier with our cats. We can use the carrier as their hiding place. We can use the hunting feeders to have them hunt overnight. And also, by the way, that small tiny portion of only a ping pong ball if you're feeding your cat half a cup of food at a time and they have nothing to do with all their anxiety and they gobble it up, they're going to throw it back up. I call that scarf and barf. When you decrease the anxiety and let them hunt for those little portions in the way that they were designed to, that goes away. So when we understand their instincts and provide for them, we get the life that we want. And I know I'm hearing the, the imaginary voices uh, of people out there saying, yeah, but I got the climbing tree and my cat never doesn't use it. They wanna sit next to me. But I want you to know that your cat needs it even if they don't use it. Wherever you are right now, look around your space. I bet there's windows and doors. Imagine if I took them all away. So even if you don't, you're not walking through the door right now, you're not walking through the, the climbing through the window right now but you need to know that it's there because that's how you stay safe. If something were to come and get you, you always subconsciously have your exit strategy and your cat needs the same thing. For your cat, that means places to climb and places to hide. So when we understand the difference between people and cats and we meet their minimum needs, we're actually treating the root causes of these problems, not medicating them away with Prozac, which is necessary for some cats, but not as many as are on it. We're not treating the, the peeing outside the litter box and even peeing blood outside the litter box. We're not just putting them on antibiotics. We're looking at, is this a bacterial infection? And if it's not, let's understand that. Let's not just throw antibiotics at it. And what about the behavior pharmacy? Is my cat stressed? Instead of reaching for drugs as a first line of defense, and again, necessary for some cats, but when we understand how to meet their minimum needs, the bad behaviors almost always go away. If it's not a medical problem, always best to start ruling out first that it's medical. And that is how we keep cats in their home. 
That is how we decrease the rate of euthanasia. And that's how we change lives. So I hope you learned something today. Uh, and I am excited to answer any questions that you might have. So we have tons of questions Yay. rolling on in Dr. Liz. I'm going to try to get to all of them. Great. Um, but I will say, um, you know, a lot of them are, are related to multi-cat households. So yeah. when it comes to the, the feeders, when it comes to, um, you know, kind of meeting these needs, there's a lot of questions around multi-cats and like, um, some that maybe are a little bit more, uh, liberal yeah. with their intake. I, and I such. love these questions. I love these questions. And you're going to learn a lot. I, I kind I didn't know whether, how much to get into it because I know that the next lecture is going to be talking about it. So don't miss the next lecture, but we talked about Cats are solitary hunters, so they're designed to hunt and eat alone. So even in your multi-cat household, not only is each cat a hunter, but each cat should be hunting and eating alone. So you wanna be able to provide those resources for each cat. And when you're having your cat um, eat from the bowl in the kitchen, you're actually creating an uh, unnatural environment. You're creating stress. So you, even if you don't see, if you're seeing fights at the food bowl, you know it's bad because cats are also conflict avoiders. They do everything they can to not get into it with each other. So you, you, you're really creating a situation where you might see your cat peeing outside the litter box later in a, a situation that seems to have nothing to do with eating, but it's because of the, maybe because of the fight at the food bowl. So if you're worried about every cat getting enough to eat, you wanna make sure each cat understands how to use them. And I made an explainer video that maybe I, you guys can help me share later for how to transition the cat from the bowl to the hunt. I'll show you really quick. This is the new guy, it's adjustable, so you can um, make it different sizes for your food. You, you can, the most efficient way to do it, I've, now I have like 150,000 cats have done this and are eating this way, which is so exciting, but take the skin off and get some sort of food and yummy treat. Put your treats inside the skin, just the skin with some food and put it down where your food dish was. Now, here's the cool thing about this. When your cat goes to eat it, the pheromone glands on either side of its cheek, the happy ones are gonna be brushing against it. And now it smells like happiness and food. So once they understand that food is coming from here, and I usually do it about an hour before mealtime when they are hungry, but not hangry. Uh, and you're gonna pick up the bowl so they're not confused, put this down, and then you're gonna pop, once they understand how to use it reliably, you're gonna pop this guy back in, leave it wide open till they understand how to roll it reliably. And then you're gonna start hiding them. And you're gonna hide them gradually. Like I say, like a, a Easter egg for a two-year-old first, and then you're gonna hide it um, harder and harder. Eventually you're gonna have a hard time hiding it hard enough. And for everyone with a multi-cat household, this is the way cats eat in nature. When cats evolved, they evolved to, uh, they're not domesticated. So they're not a herd animal. One cat will hunt over here, the other cat hunts over there. And the only time cats choose to live together is related mothers that were raised together to have their kittens if there are enough mice. Now imagine eight to 12 mice per cat every single day, that's a lot, right? So, uh, resources and enough resources are the most important thing. So having these for each cat to hunt and eat is really important. Um, I have a brand new wet feeder. So I just put a little squeeze cheese in the bottom of this. Let me see if Phoebe, Phoebe's here with me, if she's going to want to eat it. But we want to do the same, all the same principles. Hey, Phoebe, come here. She's been snacking on all sorts of good stuff, so she might not want to play with me right now. But um, same principles, hunt, catch, play, multiple small meals a day. That food should be the size of a ping pong ball or less. So you take your, sorry, I don't have my little scoop here. You take your tablespoon of wet food 
put it into your wet feeder, squish it. Can you see these grippers in there? You're gonna squish it into the grippers and then your cat is gonna lick it out. Phoebe just came out. So I don't force my cats to do anything. Um, and cats, as you know, are not usually on demand performers. So uh, I can get you videos later of all this stuff. Um, but th when they eat from this, the wet food, it slows them down and is interactive. So it's lick, 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 lick. And most cats will purr the entire time they're doing it. So that is the wet food, the dry food. Um, if you're super concerned about one cat getting all the food and the other cat not getting any, um, usually uh, in my house, my cats hunt in separate bedrooms. And I'm just seeing right here about whisper, whisker exhaustion. Great question. So for this one, the food dispenses onto the floor. And uh, so they, there's no, it's perfectly flat. There's no whisker exhaustion. And this one they lick out of and it's curved so that their whiskers are not um, jump, bumping into it. The whisker exhaustion is really interesting. The science is still out. We know the whiskers are sensory. We know they're very important, um, but there's not, we still, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot of data on whisker fatigue. And I see someone asking now if the wet food will go bad. Yes. So I worked on this design for four years because I was hoping to do something magical, but anything that I could do that was like refrigerated and then warmed, are you gonna pay $400 for wet food? No. So this is to put it down, split it up into a couple and leave them around and know that, you know, just like food on a plate, you're gonna be picking it up in an hour or so. So the, the dry feeders, you can use freeze dried um, like chicken or treats or their food and hide these around to have them have that experience over and over and um, use this just more for meals that you can pick it up and take it away. Um, I saw someone ask about uh, automatic feeders and I personally am very opinionated about automatic feeders because when, yes, it does portion control, which is wonderful. And yes, it helps cats uh, who are overweight lose weight sometimes. But almost everyone that I know who uses an automatic feeder, I say for about an hour, maybe just a half hour before the scheduled time, where's your cat? Almost everyone who's using a, uh, a Timed feeder says their cat is like this, waiting at the automatic feeder for it to go off. So I think automatic feeders increase anxiety. I don't have a study to prove that, but take a look at your cat. Do they look relaxed and happy sitting there by the feeder for an hour? Um, or, they, uh, or they look anxious. To me, they look anxious. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, Becky, are there any other questions? I was trying to answer what I could read. Oh my goodness, there are tons of questions. And oh, so good. We're, you know, um, but we're we're running a bit out of time, and the I think the most important question I wanted to ask you next is, people are asking for more information on this carrier. So can you tell them more about um, weight ranges, car safety, and how they may or may not be able to get it? Yes. So um, right now. It is, you guys got the first sneak peek. This is like the big announcement. It's gonna be called the Sleep and Go three in one cat carrier. And it's not even here yet. It is uh, gonna be launching in November. Um, and I hope that you're gonna be able to buy it everywhere. Um, in terms of car safety, so to be crash test uh, uh, certified, et cetera, et cetera, um, I would have had to use a very different, different construction and uh, the cost, um, I'm very sensitive to cost. Uh, through my journey in being a cat parent, um, I know how hard it is to make ends meet and now more than ever. And I didn't, as a vet and a mom, I had no idea how expensive it was to make these things. So if I had to make it car uh, crash tested, it would be like three or four times the price. So I'm trying so hard to be able to retail this for under $100. Um, 
So it is not, it, it's soft-sided. It's, it's soft-sided, um, but then in, let's see if I can unzip here and show you. Inside, I don't have a lot of space back here, so forgive me because that's a little awkward. Um, inside is a bed and then a plastic, can you see that? It's a plastic liner inside. Yeah. So in the unfortunate instance where your cat has an accident of some sort, um, by the way, I just want to show you, Phoebe is jumping inside. This is her bed. time to get in my carrier. And Don't she loves wrong. it because um, it's a happy place. Yeah. Uh, and um, so, so you can wipe it and clean it, but it is not crash tested. So that's why I say put it between the back seat and the front seat in that well is the safest place for a carrier um, in the car. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, and on that note, on this, um, we are making a big announcement. We have one more big, and I'm kind of a little jealous here. Uh, what's the announcement? So I'm super excited because one of you is going, you're gonna have to wait a few more weeks, but one of you is gonna get the very first Doc and Phoebe's Sleep and Go 3 in one Carrier. To, right now, we're gonna pick somebody and uh, and then uh, we're gonna ship it to you as soon as we get it here. You're gonna get it before any of the stores or the vets or anyone. The one I have here is, um, it's like, it's not even the completely finished one. That's my prototype. So it's like, woohoo! And then right. I, hope, I hope you love it. If you have any questions, you can email. I love talking about cats. So you can email me at uh, liz at doclizbales.com and we can talk about cats and I can help you with your carrier. And uh, I'm here for you. So let's, let's save some lives together. Let's keep cats in their homes and share this great news. Get a carrier that you want out in your house all the time so that you take your cat to the vet so that they get that regular vet care. Um, and for who's our winner, Becky? How are we doing? Are you this? ready? We are going to spin the wheel. Can you see the wheel? That's so cool. So we want everybody to know that you have, even if you just registered, we've got you in this wheel. So I tap to spin. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. Marcella Martin. Marcella Martin. Woohoo! Marcella Martin, you are the lucky winner of our the very first. The the I mean so like it, so it hot it off the press. didn't say Becky Mosser at gmail.com like I had hoped that it would, <laughs> but I am in the line for this product. Do Dr. Liz, we could talk to you all day long. And the that fact of the matter is, is you guys already know Dr. Liz is a regular on our um, Instagram lives, on our Facebooks, on um, cat coaching. So you know where to find us. You know where to find her. Um, I have got your email up in those chat comments. Hey, so you know what I need? if you guys can and you're interested, would you like me on Facebook and Instagram? Because yeah. like, I, I don't, I don't like, I don't even want to want to be that person, but um, it matters. Yeah. And, you, where do they find that? you on social media? Blah, blah, blah. Doc Liz Bales Veterinarian on Instagram and Facebook. And I am going to be doing the veterinary um, information for Modern Cat Magazine. So take a look for me coming soon um, all over the place. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. You're Just look around. Dr. <laughs> Bales will be there. And we, again, are so lucky to have your time. We're so lucky to have your friendship. Um, you guys that are asking, Dr. Liz's email is up in that chat. Scroll through. We'll include it in the notes. Um, you guys, this recording and then notes are all going to be emailed out to you guys as well as um, Dr. Liz's email after the conference. So don't you worry. More to come. Um, Dr. Liz, we again, we could talk to you all day long, but we're going to have to let you go because, as you know, we have the amazing and the brilliant Dr. Mike Delgado up next. Yes, you guys, and she's amazing. She's one of the only PhDs in feline behavioral medicine in the country. She's amazing. Yeah, and Dr. McCall is excited. We're excited to have her. You know, like I said, we've got all our friends here today. Thanks for kicking us off. I can't think of a better kick off than I Dr. Liz Bales. I love Base Buzz. What you guys are doing is amazing. You are amazing. And thank you to all the participants who care enough to come learn the real science that has yeah. data behind it. You're everything. Share the word. Share it.
That's right. Oh, that's the, that's the, that's, you've said it all right there. Dr. Liz, we will see you soon. We will talk to you very, very soon. And thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.